Uh, how are you doing this morning? Good? Good? Had to drive all the way down from up by Cherokee, North Carolina this morning. So I had to get up at 5.30 in the morning. Been okay if I hadn't been sick all night. But um, God is good. I got a whole pocket full of, uh, of these uh, lozenges that they've given me, and they've given me some hot tea and everything else. And if anybody wants to shake my hand after the service, we can do that, and I can pass on what I have to you. It's no problem. <laughs> I'm, I'm cool with that. How many of you were here in the first service or listened to the first service? Well, good news. This sermon will be half as long because it doesn't have a translator that goes with it, okay? So we'll see if we can get you out a little earlier. Um, I've got a countdown clock that's going up there, so I'm going to do my best to stay on that countdown clock. If you would, join me in prayer first before we begin. Heavenly Father, I ask that you anoint me by the power of your Holy Spirit. Deliver the word that you've laid upon my heart. May it be true, strong, and real, and may it touch the hearts and lives of the people here. Lord, open their hearts like fertile soil, that the seed of your word might be planted within them, and it might bring forth fruit a hundredfold. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's wonderful to be here in an international church, opportunities to speak with you, and, um, and to share what God has done in my life uh, as pastor said we've been all over the world my son was in three different high schools in three different countries and so when you start looking at life and um and what is it that holds people together brings people together and keeps families together part of that is loving one another and also the love of christ being shared amongst us and agreed upon together and I asked my children at one point in time when I was praying with some other chaplains whose children no longer follow the Lord, and I said, why, to my children, are you still following God? And pa parents, I want you to listen to this. My son said to me, Dad, you made Christianity attainable. It was something that we enjoyed. And I saw other Christian soldiers in our home who were serving God and they had the choice not to but they chose to do that and I said that's what I want in my life and so I tell you as parents keep Christianity attainable that's the whole message today if I were to wrap it all up into a, an, an, into a nutshell that God loves us and as parents, I love my children. And that God wants a relationship with them the same way he wants one with me. Now, as far as an international church, I, I told a little bit this morning before I start that I was in Kuwait in the army. And while I was in Kuwait, I went to a Chinese home church. And they were having a covered dish dinner and um, the food was definitely very Chinese. They were poor immigrants, and, um, and I had never eaten some of the things in any Chinese restaurant I've been to before. But one of the men that was there said to me, this is really interesting. I said, what is that? He said, I am from China. I'm living and working in Kuwait. I'm meeting here in an Indian man's home to find out about a Jewish carpenter named Jesus who can change my life. That's international. That's what Christianity is. It's not for the people of the Bible. It's not for Americans. It's not for people in the Slavic countries. It's not for people in South America. It's not for people in China only. It is for people all over the world. Jesus died for all mankind and womankind to be politically correct. So today what I want to talk about is from the book of Colossians. When I was asked to preach, I said, oh sure, I love to preach. I have some great sermons. And they said, well, we're doing a series on the book of Colossians and we'd like you to keep in the series and preach from Colossians. Fine, maybe it'd be one of those good passages about Jesus nailing my sins to his cross. And they said, no, you're preaching on Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 23. That's not a good passage. 
pastor said, well, you don't have to preach from that if you don't want to. I said, listen, if it was me and I was a pastor, I would make the visiting guy preach on that because I don't want to preach on it. <laughs> so I was up with most of the night struggling along with, God, please lay something on my heart, and hopefully this will do it for you today. So look with me if you would. I'm going to put on my glasses so I can actually see what I'm reading and read from Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 to 23. It's not that exciting, let me tell you. But when we're all said and done, hopefully it will be. So let no one condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come and Christ himself is that reality. So don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship like angels saying that they have had visions about these things their simple minds have made them proud and they are not connected to Christ the head of the body for he holds the whole body together and its joints ligaments and it grows as God nourishes it now here's the key verse verse 20 you have died with Christ and he has set you free. Is it up there behind me? May not be reading exactly like mine, but I want you to get that part. He has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of this world? Rules like don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are just mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denials, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desire. Okay, preacher man, let's make something out of this. What do you say? I'm going to talk to you today about legalism, rule keeping. And the name or title of my sermon is The Church of Do's and Don'ts. The Church of Rules. Is that the kind of church you really want to be a part of and invite your friends to? Come on with me to church. It's a great place. It's a place where you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't. Don't, 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 and oh, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this. That's the church of do's and don'ts. It's freedom versus rules, spies, imprisonment, torture, death. I was stationed in Germany when the Berlin Wall came down. The Soviet Iron Curtain in, was in Schweinfurt, only about 20 miles from our house. When it came down, I visited the Jewish concentration camp of Buchenwald, which had lots of other Slavic um, people that were imprisoned there. I went to Dachau, and I went to Flossenburg. I saw the atrocities, and I wanted to witness them personally that was committed against humankind. I saw what could be done to people. I read the slogan on the iron gates on all three of those concentration camps, and I believe if you go to, uh, to Auschwitz, you'll read the same sign written in iron on the gates. Arbeiten macht frei. Work makes free. That didn't work too well for all the people that were in there dying, being gassed, starved. Work makes free. It was a place of rules, spies, imprisonment, torture, and death. I later in Germany went to what was the Stasi headquarters. Stasi was a secret police. I went there, witnessed it, looked. 
I wanted to see what 50 years of living in freedom in East Germany would be like as freedom was translated by secret police of spies. I went into the building and looked around and saw the rooms of torture, death, imprisonment, freedom. It's interesting. We stopped here, as Pastor said on Friday, we went to lunch together with his family. And they were setting up for a big celebration here for Friday night. How many were here at the celebration Friday night? Anybody with the music and anything else? It was for, it was for the Ukrainian uh, Independence Day, being set free around the same time that the Iron Curtain came down. It was interesting as everybody was celebrating, looking at freedom. Some of you may have experienced new life of false freedom that was controlled with rules, spies, fear, threat, imprisonment, torture, death. With the experience of what is now true freedom, and for those of you here, oh, in America, we look back at, oh yeah, when we were under British rule, 4th of July, you know, 1776, we, we've been set free. That's too far ago. But we do enjoy what is true freedom. And who would ever want to return to what would be a false freedom? You know who? People that want the power and the control. You see, no one wants to be oppressed unless you are the oppressor. Make sense? It's okay to live in those countries if you're the king, huh? If you get to do all the oppressing. So that brings us to our scripture. Paul, writing to the church of Colossians, and Colossae, the church in Colossae, or the Colossians, it was a Roman colony in what be like Turkey today. Paul was there and he was, what Paul never actually visited Colossae, but Paul wrote them this letter. So let me ask, who was Paul? He was a man that served God as a Pharisee, a driven proponent of a list of do's and don'ts, which gave him power and control over others. He enjoyed the power and the control. If you recall, Paul is busy arresting Christians all over, throwing them into jail, their families, everything else, for following this new guy named Jesus. And Paul's actually on the road to Damascus when something changes. He met the man, Jesus, who spoke to him. Now, Jesus has already been uh, crucified and resurrected. But Paul's life changed when he met the Messiah. He met the Christ. Paul's question in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 is so important. Here's what it says. You've died with Christ and he has set you, what? Free from spiritual powers of this world. So why, why do you keep on following the rules of this world? Why are our churches doing that? Why is Christianity doing that? You know why? Why do they have these powers or these rules? So that they can maintain power and control. I'm a parent. I liked rules as a parent. I remember being a teenager. I did not like rules as a teenager. And my wife would say now, as I'm busy driving here and driving back, I obviously don't like rules because I drive a little bit faster than the speed limit. (laughs) But rules bring power and rules bring control. And Paul's saying, if you've been set free, why would you want to be back under that? No one would want to be under that unless 
You are the rule maker, the power broker, and you're the one in control. And that's where the church runs off generation after generation and especially the new generation. As soon as I'm 18, man, I'm out of here. As soon as I'm in college, hey, no more church for me. I'm staying home like dad stays home. I don't need this anymore. I don't need your rules. I don't need what you're trying to impose upon me. So let me ask you a few questions. Do you ever feel like a Christian failure because you don't fit in or you struggle with the Christian rules? Do hmm? you feel like a failure? Have you been hurt by the church, by Christians, by family? for failure to keep the rules or meet their religious expectations? Are rules used to control or scare you to be good or get you into heaven? Does it make you feel like God's not happy with you? Are you trying to make God happy by keeping all the rules? Maybe people at church are more spiritual than you. Or maybe you're on one of the ones that people at church are less spiritual than you. Would people say that you love rules more than you love other people? Well, let's talk about it. Legalism. Legalism is a form of religion, of do's and don'ts, to measure my holiness. Just how holy am I? Am I worthy? Oh, I was so close. I thought I was holy enough, but then I broke and fell. Am I worthy? Am I worthy enough? Am I accepted or don't I fit in? What do I do to measure other people? to see if they're really Christians or not? Do they have to fit in with my set of rules? You know, they're just not as good as me. I go to youth group, I run a small group. I'm I'm, I'm in the praise band. And I'll tell you what, we are awesome. Did you see us today? Oh my goodness, spirit of God moving, you know why? (laughs) Because it was us leading it, that's why. (laughs) Oh, it was wonderful. (laughs) I don't normally play this well, but oh man, when the Holy Spirit anoints me, oh man, I'm, I'm just, I'm incredible, I'm incredible. If you were only as, well, you could join us. Nah, I'm just kidding. You see, uh, you got to measure up. When my wife and I went to college, way back in dinosaurs roamed the earth, (laughs) everybody was excited because it was the first year girls could wear blue jeans. Women, excuse me, could wear blue jeans after 3 p.m., not before. Because you see, God had a problem with women wearing blue jeans before 3 p.m., but after 3 p.m., it was okay. No one could wear shorts on campus at all, showing those bare legs, oh, please. Unless it was a soccer game or a football or or a basketball game. But you had to wear pants to the gym, and then you could put on the shorts and play the game so everybody could see you running around and jumping and putting the ball into the hoop. 
But then when it was over, you had to put pants back on again because it was, you didn't want to run around without your pants on. Same way with soccer. Oh, heaven forbid. I mean, you could slide into the goal with a full wide spread going into the goal, but that was okay. Afterwards, put those pants back on. Legalism. You say, that's just crazy. It wasn't then. How long could a man's hair be? Well, Jesus had long hair, but that was okay because that was Bible times, you know. But for guys, it better be high and tight. Whenever my father got mad at me, you know what every lecture always ended with? Anybody out there? What did every lecture end with? Get a haircut. Guaranteed. Get a haircut. Legalism. You see, the problem is legalism measures worthiness, acceptance, rather than the immeasurable grace of God. Legalism has no power, no power to save or to transform lives. So let's talk about legalism quickly here because I'm watching that clock down, countdown clock. Legalism brings condemnation. You read it there in, with me in Corinthians, uh, in Colossians, excuse me, verse 16 and verse 18. Both times Paul says, don't let anyone condemn you. Romans 8, 12, Paul writing to the Roman church, he says in chapter 8, there is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus because you belong to him. The law of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the laws of sin and death. But you see, condemnation is power and control. We get condemned for what we are supposed to do. Have you ever heard the words, now that you are a Christian you have to, you have to what? Fill in the blank. Now that you're a Christian, you're supposed to in order to what? Make the people at church happy? Make your family happy? Make God happy? Do you really think that we make God happy? or sad, but that's what we think because we live in a a world, if we're not careful of, do's and don'ts. That's the church we attend, the church of do's and don'ts. I'm not saying this church, I'm just saying the Christian life at times. We come up with all kinds of requirements of what you must do. One of those that you must do that Paul writes in that piece is how to worship. See, in Colossians, it was worship like the angels worship. Praise band this morning and the first service, the praise band now and, the, and, and those that are singing, fabulous, sounded like angels. But is that your wrong kind of music? Do you like the hymns? Is that what you grew up with? Is what you're comfortable with? Or how about bringing out a chorus that I know the words to without having to write them up there on the screen? Give me something from Hillsong. Why elevation worship all the time? Give me Hillsong. Something from, you know, the 90s. Let me sing that and I'll raise my hands and do my stuff. I heard that that bass drum and we'll talk about that bass guitar, but we don't really want to, is the heartbeat of the devil. How are we supposed to worship? I saw some of you raising your hands, praising God. Others not. Those who raise their hands are far more spiritual. Oh, my goodness. Oh, they let them down. 
That one's really spiritual. You know, some are just lift the baby. Others are wash the windows. Oh, my goodness gracious. Those are really the spiritual ones. I heard somebody speaking in tongues today. Now, it could have been in another language, and I'm just ignorant of it. But were they more spiritual? I saw someone else that was just standing there not singing at all. Oh, God bless her soul. They just don't measure up to what is Christianity in my book. They're just missing out on the blessing of God, you know. (laughs) He wants so much more from them, and they are just won't let loose, won't let the spirit move. (laughs) Don't I measure up. Dues. All kinds of do's of how we're supposed to worship, how we're supposed to act. How are we supposed to act? Or how are we supposed to worship? I told a story this morning, and I'll I'll give it eh, quickly. When my daughter, and some of you may relate to this, when she was only four years old, she told my wife, when I die, I don't want to go to heaven. Four-year-old. And So my wife said, Why wouldn't you want to go to heaven? She says, because all you do is sing songs, play a harp, fly around. Sing songs, play a harp, fly around. And you know the worst part, mom? And she said, no, what? She said, you can't even die to get away from it. (laughs) That's the opinion of a four-year-old. Is that the view that we give them of what church is? Fortunately, she's now 35, loves the Lord, pastor, or works in her church as a small group leader and with the youth, works with the youth. And I think she wants to go to heaven when she dies. But we make it into so much difficulty of the dues and how we represent the traditions, can we wear blue jeans before 3 p.m.? Can I wear shorts? The traditions that we grew up with, well, it was good enough for me, it was good enough for Paul in the Bible, therefore it's gonna be good enough for you. You know, that's oftentimes not true. A lot of times we take things that are non-essentials and we make them obstacles instead If you want to know my Jesus, if you want to be a part of us, if you want to fit in, then you have to look like us, dress like us, act like us, be like us. If you're not, you're condemned. So I guess I could say it. You'd forgive me if I say it sucks to be you. Hope you're good with stoking fires because that's what you'll be doing for eternity. Well, I'll tell you what. How do we represent? How do we honor? How do we act? I'll tell you something really important. If you're taking notes, you can write it down. Just because you act like a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. Even at church. I have a neighbor in Florida, wonderful man. He's generous, kind. He donated a kidney to somebody that needed it and it wasn't even a family member. perfect model of a good person, but not a Christian. Just because they act like a Christian doesn't make them a Christian. It just makes them a good person. Then we also condemn people, not for what they do, but for what they don't. 
Colossians 2, 21 to 22 says, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are mere human teachings. See, the problem is the thought that the more that you don't do makes you closer to God or brings you closer to God. And Paul's saying that is false. But if you take a polling of America and you survey them and you ask them what is a Christian, you know what they'll probably say to you? Christians are people who don't dance, drink, smoke, or chew, or hang out with people who do. It's a list of don'ts. And that's what we have told people as they come through the doors of our church is that you can't do this, you can't do that, you have to do this, you have to do that. And that's what we put out that Christianity is, a list of don'ts, and that's what the world has bought into and they think we are, a list of don'ts. And they feel condemned because if they do, then they're condemned. John 3, 15. I'm so, excuse me, John 13, 35. Jesus, at the Last Supper, the night before he's crucified, he tells his disciples, this is how the world will know that you are my disciples. By this all will know that you are my disciples, that you wear a suit and a tie every time you go to church, that you raise your hands when you pray. You say, God bless you. I'll be praying for you. You're part of the group. You don't dance, smoke, drink or chew, and you certainly don't hang out with the folks who do. You are now one of my disciples. And if the world knows us as that, Guess what? The world doesn't want that. And as a parent, if that's what my children know Christianity is, that's why they don't want it either. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have Love for one another. Love. Loving them into the church. Bringing them in because we love them and God loved us. That's what brings people in. Not condemnations of don't touch this, don't taste that, don't handle this. You see, the problem with legalism is legalism replaces God. It does. It becomes a set of rules. That's what the Pharisees were doing. That's what happened that Jesus was busy preaching against. You guys have so many rules, he tells them. You travel all over the world to find one disciple to make them twice a son of Satan as yourself. Oh my gracious, they didn't like that, by the way. But do we do the same things? Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, 23, these rules, these things that you come up with, they may seem wise, but they require strong devotions, pious self-denials, and severe bodily disciplines, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. You see, legalism tries to do what God 
wants to do. That's the problem. With all of our rules that we come up with to be a Christian, we're trying to make Christians, make people into Christians rather than letting God and the Holy Spirit make people into Christians. We're trying to change people's lives and behavior with a whole system of threats and rewards. That's what we do. You don't do this, you're not going to get to go to heaven. I remember, how many of you remember the Left Behind series or any of that type stuff? If you don't do this or you're busy doing that, you're going to get left behind. My wife was raised, if you're sitting in a movie theater and Jesus comes back, you're not going to heaven, even if it's a Disney film. Now everybody has it streaming in their own home TVs. It replaces God. But here's the thing. No matter how much I try to change somebody's behavior or control their behavior, either with threats or rewards, it's only God who can change a heart. Only God can cleanse a heart. Only God can make them a new creation. You see, legalism tries to replace God's love and his relationships. It brings us into spiritual competition with ourselves and others. Remember those questions I asked at the beginning? Do you feel like a failure, a Christian failure? Do you feel like you just don't fit in? Like you don't measure up? Are you feeling like being a Christian is just too hard? Maybe it's because you're trying to measure yourself to other people. Maybe instead of going, yeah, I'm okay. It's, I've fallen short, I can't make it. God doesn't love me, why try? I'll never be like him, I'll never be like her. I, I, I'll never be the sister Teresa. Mother Teresa, I'll never be the next Billy Graham. Heck, I can't even be like my grandma. God must not love me. He definitely loves them a lot more than he loves me. Isn't that sad? But you know what? That's what we impose upon people with legalism. That's what we do when people feel that they have to measure up in some way and they don't realize that God loves them right where they are, how they are, who they are. God wants to bring the changes in your life, yes. But God's job is to do that, not me and not somebody else. God wants to work in my life and that's what Paul is trying to tell the Colossians and the Romans and the people in Jerusalem and the people in Philippi, the people in Ephesus, the people all over him. That's what he's instructing his protégés, Timothy and Titus. He's telling them, hey, let God's grace and love work in people's lives because that's what changes lives. Don't do God's job. Let God do God's job. And don't feel like you'll never be good enough. And at 
the same time, the opposite. Don't feel like you're superior and more spiritual than everybody else. Because God doesn't want me to be the next Billy Graham. God doesn't want you to be the next Mother Teresa. God wants you to be you with his son, Jesus Christ, living in the Holy Spirit, living within you. God wants to use you as you, just as wacky and crazy and nut job that you are. He wants you because he's got a place for it. And whether you stand there quiet while everybody sings and praises, don't feel like you're not good enough. God wants you to be you. And if God wants you to be jumping around and raising your hands, he'll light you on fire, trust me. But if he wants you to just stand there and be quiet and to live in relationship with him, then that's good. That's good. Is there something more? There's always something more because we're his children and we're living and growing in him. But something more doesn't mean it has to be like him or like her. That's that measuring tape, measuring again. God wants you like you. Look at the goofy group of disciples that he selected. If you're ever watching The Chosen, that the, the movie series, the TV series, The Chosen, they're the most goofed up group of guys ever. And I can tell you what, if you're busy reading the Bible, you're going, oh yeah, that's true. They're, they're goofy. And God used them to turn the world upside down. God wants to do the same with you. So what does God actually ask of me? What does he want for me? The same thing he wants for you, and this is very simple. He wants salvation. That's it. That's where it starts. God wants you to proclaim Jesus as Lord of your life, Lord of my life. He wants us to believe that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If it steps up there, it's going to say, close to this anyways. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you'll believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it's by confessing with your mouth that you are saved, not by a list of do's and don'ts. It just, it doesn't say, if you do this and this, then you'll be good enough to become a Christian. What it says is God loves us and all he wants us to do is say, I believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want him to be the Lord of my life. God wants salvation and he wants a personal relationship with me. And he wants a personal relationship with you. He wants you to be his son. He wants you to be his daughter. He wants you to be just like Jesus and those wacky disciples. As he loved them, was patient with them, taught them, and then set them free into the world to turn it upside down. He wants a personal relationship with us as son and daughters, but he also wants a personal relationship for us with other believers. Loving, caring, mentoring, encouraging, not judging and measuring to see who fits in and who doesn't. He wants a relationship and us to have one with others. He wants us to be sons and daughters. He wants us to be brothers and sisters. And then God wants in that relationship for us to spend eternity with him. It's what he wants, eternal life. So what's my challenge to you today? What can you take home? Okay, here's the take home piece. Number one, 
let legalism go along with all the power struggles and the controls let it go whether you're on the top of the legalism side inflicting power and control over others or whether you're trapped on the bottom side of it feeling like you're being controlled and power over you are powerless God says let the legalism go it doesn't do a thing as Paul says it's just mere teachings human teachings but God has set us free number two don't allow the non-essentials like what you wear what you touch what you eat what you handle don't let these become obstacles to your faith or someone else's faith to your growth or somebody else's growth major in the majors not in the minors non-essentials don't let them be obstacles and then the last challenge is practice Christian unity and encouragement at home and at church parents tell your kids over and over and over that you love them that you are proud of them and you're honored to be their parent kids love your parents encourage your folks say to them thank you for being my mom for being my dad for all the things you do for me thank you for taking me to church introducing me to the one who changes lives Jesus Christ thank you for modeling what it really means to love and to be a Christian because when I'm old or older I want to do the same for my kids I love you and for those of you in the church youth groups small groups visitors coming through the door do the same thing encourage mentor model love them and show them your love remember this our faith is founded built and angled, anchored on a single person and a single event Jesus died was buried and three days later rose from the dead just as he said he would not do's and don'ts or the church of do's and don'ts please join me in prayer Heavenly Father Lord I ask that something in this message would speak to each person's heart or at least someone's heart that they would look and say yeah I've been really judgmental I measure everything and everybody I can't help it it's the way I was raised Help them to see, Lord, that there's so much more. That you don't want us to judge. You don't want us to be a home or a church of do's and don'ts. And Lord, for those who feel victimized or cast out by do's and don'ts, let them know that you love them. they'll know we're your disciples not by do's and don'ts but by the love you have for us and the love we have for one another so father help me to love others the way that you loved me as messed up and goofy as I was and I am you 
still took me in, you still love me. Father, help me to be that way with others around me. I ask these things in Jesus' name.